Hola and welcome back to This Is Mexico, the channel where I, a British guy, react to all things Mexico, whether it is the history, culture, people, music, food, anything there is to know about Mexico. I'm going to learn about it. I'm going to react to it so I can find out more and discover more about this really awesome country that I have come to value a lot more um, most recently. Um, as you can see from the title of today's video, I'm going to be reacting to a video that is called History Summarized Mexico. This is what I imagine to be a short history of Mexico from very early back when to kind of more recently. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Um, I love history, so I love finding out about the history of other countries. So I'm really excited to find out more about Mexican history. I have some ideas. I do know some things um, about Mexican history. When I was in Mexico City, I went to the Anthropological Museum. I think it's called that. Um, and I learned some bits there, so I know some things, um, but I'm excited to learn more. So let's do it. This is History Summarized Mexico. Let's go. Mexico has got a lot going on in its history. From ancient civilizations building temples to the sun and sowing panic about the year 2012, to a great empire with a city in the middle of a lake and a habit of hucking people off of pyramids, to its less than willing participation in new world globalization and its development into an independent nation state. To put that into proper historical terminology, that's a lot of stuff going on. So to organize this and find out how Mexico became Mexico, let's do some history. This video is brought to you by NordVPN. More on that later. I love a bit of While history. civilization along this stretch of lands dates back thousands of years to players like the Olmecs, the Zapotecs, and the Maya, our story begins in the power vacuum left by the collapse of the Toltec Empire in 1122 AD. In the absence of any one dominant power, a series of small city-states carved out their own little corners of influence. 200 years later, the Mexica tribe settled right in the middle of Lake Texcoco to fulfill... <laughs> A prophecy. They were told that the apparition of an eagle perched atop a cactus and eating a snake would mark their new home. So upon seeing it, rather than look a gift eagle in the beak, they camped out right in the lake and began building the city of Tenochtitlan. The Mexica then allied with two of their neighbors to form the Aztec Empire. Through a combination of military skills, some fetching outfits, and a trusty obsidian macahuitl, the Aztec Empire grew to dominate the land from coast to coast. Meanwhile, the capital of Tenochtitlan became a fabulously huge and beautiful city of canals, I can just, like, I kind of wish I could go back in time sometimes to these <clears throat> ancient places because just looking at that right there, imagine, like, being able to go back, walk down there, see it as it was in its glory days. I feel like it would just be absolutely incredible, so magical. I mean, there's very few places like this in the world. I mean, there are quite a few, obviously, um, but um, it's just so, it's so different to how life looks today and I think just walking down there seeing these huge structures um I just think it would be awesome unfortunately I can't time travel but it would be good if I could um because I would love to see it palaces markets aqueducts and more ¿Dónde está el Dorado? and then the conquistador showed up some 30 years yep. after Columbus accidentally wandered into the Caribbean, Spain was in full-on empire mode. Though there wasn't a great deal to be found in the Antilles, some scouts brought word that there was a shiny big civilization to sack on the mainland to the west. So one enterprising gentleman by the name of Hernán Cortés defied the crown's yeah. orders and hopped over to the mainland in 1519 with some 500 fellow conquistadors, the absolute greediest and nastiest brutes that Renaissance Spain had to offer. While the numbers game wasn't strictly in Spain's favor, they had steel swords and armor that made the obsidian blades and wooden shields look Look like paper mache. Now, the Aztecs, being a conquering empire, had made a series of enemies, like their neighbors the Tlaxcalans, who were all too thrilled to offer thousands of warriors for Cortez's army. But perhaps the most deadly ally that Spain had in this fight was smallpox, which, among other European diseases, killed anywhere from mm -hmm. half to 90% of the native Mesoamerican population. After Cortez kidnapped King Moctezuma, dodged an arrest attempt from his commanding officer, and ordered his ships to be burned to ensure there was no possibility of retreat, the conquistadors captured Tenochtitlan in 1521 after several battles and a long siege and fully eradicated the Aztec Empire. And now with all that icky pagan nonsense out of the way, Spain's got itself a brand new Spain. Step one was to stop Cortes from acting like a de facto monarch because why would he exercise restraint now? Back in Spain, King Charles V created a series of advisory boards to attempt to rein in Cortes, but when that didn't work, Charles just stripped him of his powers and established the Viceroyalty of New Spain in 1535. Step two was building up a new capital on the site of Tenochtitlan, which was newly renamed after the old tenants of the Aztec Mexica tribe, which is where we get the name Mexico. Step yeah, I mean, I've definitely heard when I was in Mexico City, I was talking to somebody who told me a little bit about the history of Mexico City, that it was 
built on a lake. And I just think that's such an awesome story. I mean, we've heard a little bit about it at the beginning of this video, but I think it's just amazing how this civilization, you know, was built on a lake. They made it work. It was obviously very awesome. And then the people that conquered them just continued to build, I guess, on top of it. And they changed the name to Mexico, which is kind of, I guess, how we kind of got the name today. So um, it's very interesting. Three was governing the place. In addition to the power of the monarchy, Spain formalized their superiority over the native peoples through a casta system, which classified everyone from Iberian-born Spaniards down to indigenous peoples with Mexican-born criollos and mixed-blood mestizos in the middle. Step three and a half was adopting an old Aztec law mandating public labor and transforming that into the Spanish encomienda system, which wasn't technically slavery, but it was pretty dang close. Step four was Christianity. In New Spain, the Catholic Church had land, power, and an undying determination to convert convert everybody. Polytheism is usually pretty open to new gods, so getting Jesus in was fairly easy, but getting Quetzalcoatl, Tezcalipoca, and the rest of the gang out was far trickier. So missionaries got a bit torch-happy and burned countless texts. A few did attempt to limit the harmful effects of colonization, but they got pushback for suggesting that non-Spaniards had, gasp, basic human dignity. And others used Aztec human sacrifice as justification that hippity-hoppity your soul is my property, so it was a rocky process. The Aztec heartland quickly became the new urban core, with spots like Mexico City and Guadalajara inland and Veracruz and Acapulco on the coast, but cities were soon going up all over New Spain. Though, as this is colonialism we're talking about, the real aim was to bring resources and wealth back to Iberia, and that came in the form of food and silver. While some Spaniards were still hunting for El Dorado, and surprising nobody but themselves, failing horribly, silver became the dominant metal export. And the old world soon got to taste cocoa, chilies, corn, and tomatoes, which which boosted and also stabilized the European food supply. The problem for Spain was that they didn't really have all that great a grasp on macroeconomics, so they overinflated their economy and squandered their money on losing wars. Spanish power swiftly dimmed, and France and Britain soon got to flexing their might in the New World. And at the end of the 18th century, Mexico fought alongside America during their War of Independence, and the Mexican soldiers who were there took some notes to bring home. At the turn of the 1800s, Mexicans were fed up with the Costa system and its favoritism of Spanish-born peninsulares. And with the success mm -hmm. of recent American and Haitian revolutions, Mexico was willing to give it a go themselves. On September 16th of 1810, a Criollo priest named Miguel Hidalgo took advantage of Spain's current kinglessness to give the cry of Dolores and begin the War of Independence, which he lost, but his idea lasted. The revolution went on in fits and starts for the next decade with some constitutions, but not a lot of independence. The problem was that nobody could agree on what they wanted out of the revolution. Independence, a republic, equal rights, all three? Depends on who you asked. But the turning point came in 1820, when Spain, now re-kinged after the Napoleonic nonsense, got a newly liberalized constitution. The higher classes feared that an exportation of those liberal ideas to Mexico would mean the end of their extremely cushy socioeconomic status. So a general in the Spanish army by the name of Agustín de Iturbide flipped and teamed up with the revolutionary leader Vicente Guerrero to hash out some compromises for a new independent government. These three guarantees of monarchy, egalitarianism, and Catholicism became the goals of the revolution. And when their combined armies marched on Mexico City, they had no trouble yeeting the Spanish loyalists right on out of there and forming an independent Mexican empire with Iturbide as emperor. <laughs> so now Mexico's got independence, but what about that carefully crafted political compromise that kind of held this whole operation together? It went pretty quickly out the window. Nobody seems to be happy with the new government, and most aristocrats carried on not giving rights to the mestizos and natives. Iturbide was ousted and later executed, and Central America seceded from the Mexican Empire. Not a great start. As time went on, the economy was stagnant because no government was strong or consistent enough to create and enforce rules, so the local economy shriveled as corruption soared. The biggest figure to emerge in the half-century after Mexican independence was Antonio López de Santa Ana, a former general turned politician who served as president and or dictator for most of the next two decades. Watch out, this becomes a trend. Santa Ana had the galaxy brain idea of encouraging American immigrants to settle in the state of Coquila y Tejas to shield from raids by the Comanche Nation and also boost the northern economy. This failed spectacularly as he essentially imported an entire population that was bound to agitate for more rights. When they did, Santa Ana effectively told them to shove it and then was surprised when they immediately revolted. Things got real at the Siege of the Alamo, but despite early Mexican victories, the Texan revolutionaries won the decisive battle of San Jacinto in 18 minutes and personally captured 
hired Santa Ana to add insult to injury. They let him go, but his problems got worse when Texas joined the ever-growing United States. They and Mexico had a mix-up over some soldiers killed on disputed land, which led to a second and even more disastrous war for Santa Ana. The U.S. invaded along the Pacific coast of California and the eastern Gulf Coast and routed Santa Ana to capture Mexico City and force a surrender. The resulting Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo saw Mexico cede all of its northern territories to the United States, from Colorado all the way to California. Yeah. This was Yeah, I mean, that was definitely one thing that I kind of knew about Mexican history already is that they obviously lost a lot of bit, quite a bit of their land to the United States at some point. Um, and it's a shame because obviously it was quite a lot of land, really, if you think about it. And it's a shame that it's no longer Mexico. Um, but I guess that that is what happened back in the day. People fought wars over land and when they lost it, they lost it. It's really hard to give it back now. So um, it's a shame, but what can you do? It was rough, as Mexico now languished in military failure, bad governance, and a deflated economy for another decade before Santa Ana was ousted for good in 1855. Two years later, a new constitution took power from the church to help prop up the lower classes, but this didn't sit super well with the church elite, so a civil war between conservative Catholics and liberal Democrats swiftly broke out. Yay. In the course of the Four-Year War, both sides borrowed huge sums of money from Spain, France, and England to finance their militaries. And when the Liberals won the war in 1861, Europe came to collect for both tabs. Which goes to show that war profiteering is great because no matter who wins, you still get rich. Easy. Obviously, Mexico couldn't pay all of this, so they defaulted on their debts. In response, the French Emperor Napoleon III decided to take matters into his own empire and invaded Mexico to place a Habsburg puppet on the throne. France landed on the Bay of Campeche and pushed towards Mexico City, but was spectacularly halted in its tracks by the Mexican army at the Battle of Puebla. Hmm. This is what Cinco de Mayo is about. It's not so much an Independence Day as an anti-recolonialism day, which is different oh. but has the same core energy to it. Unfortunately, the war wasn't over, and France regrouped to capture Mexico City and install their puppet Maximilian on the throne. Three years later, the Mexican Republican Army recaptured the North, and America shot some nasty eyes at France, so they decided, eh, better off not fighting a war on two fronts, and then they withdrew. The new Mexican government set about some much-needed reforms because, oh man, Mexico has been having a rough century here. The next four decades saw the country secularize, reform the central government to be stronger and more efficient, build infrastructure, and modernize the army. That last one is relevant because the 1880s through 1910s had another military strongman turned politician who rigged elections and manipulated the army to stay in power. After winning, and especially controversial election in 1910, widespread revolts forced him to flee. But this revolution ran into trouble when the leaders failed to agree on a new government, so Mexico descended into a decade of open rebellion. The revolutionaries were defeated, and a couple more military strongmen held the country, but things started looking up in the second half of the century, as Mexico's involvement in World War II kickstarted decades of economic progress that continues to this day. I wasn't lying when I said that Mexican history is busy, but it's also extremely complex, and the Mexican identity is one of the most fascinating and trickiest artifacts of this history. For instance, in the 80s, there was a new statue of Cortez, his Nahua wife Malinsin, and their mestizo San Martin, which intended to celebrate the convergence of cultures. But instead, it was met by fierce student protests who saw Cortez as a predator and Malinsin, or La Malinche, as a traitor to her Nahua people. The debate over this statue is a very recent microcosm of the beautiful harmonies and the stark contrasts that make up Mexico's history. A story that's deep, inspiring, and sometimes disturbing dismaying, but above all else, very much alive. As we've seen, it can be hard to protect your empire from conquistadors, but it's easy to protect your online data from hackers and thieves with today's sponsor, NordVPN. The digital world is vast and speedy, but it can okay. also be... Ex I think that is the end of the video. It's just an advert for NordVPN. So guys, that was me reacting to history summarized Mexico. It definitely gave me a lot more insight into the history of Mexico. Obviously, I did know some things, um, but a lot of it, I didn't. Um, so it was great that I learned some things here. Um, the ancient stuff is very interesting because I love ancient history. And so the history of the uh, Aztecs or Mayas, whichever one it was, um, super interesting. And the fact that they built Mexico City on a lake um, because they saw an eagle. I mean, it's just... It's really awesome and it's uh, very interesting to me. But a lot of, a lot, a lot happened um, since the time the Spanish first came uh, up till now. There was a lot going on. There was a lot of wars, which I guess is very typical for those 
days, those years back in history, there was a lot of fighting all over the world over land. Um, but there was definitely a lot going on in Mexico. And uh, it's yeah, really interesting how the effect of Europeans coming over to Mexico just really changed everything about Mexico and, and the lands and the culture. And so, yeah. That was was interesting. I learned a lot. I might need to watch again so I can, I don't know, maybe absorb some of the information even more. Um, but this was really helpful in me learning some basic knowledge of Mexican history. Like I said, I already knew some bits, but especially the, the stuff from Spanish colonialism upwards to today, there wasn't much in there that I didn't know. Um, so it's good that I watched this video so that I can learn. And uh yeah, I mean, what a colourful history it is. It's a busy, colourful history. Um, there was lots of things going on. Let me know in the comments below, guys, if there was anything in history, in Mexican history, that this video left out and you think I should know about. Um, anything that you can think of that particularly stands out. Um, yeah, I just want to learn as much as I can because I just, I love learning things. Uh, whether it's about history, whether it's about culture, geography, people, places, food. Like I just, I always love just learning new things, meeting new people and just, you know, experiencing the world. That's why I love traveling so much. So this was really interesting to me. Like I said, I learned a lot. And next time I go back to Mexico, you know, I feel like I'm going to have much more of an understanding of this country, especially as I continue doing these videos, um, not just in history, but all aspects of Mexico um, and I feel like definitely the next time I go back I just it's going to be much better in my head and I'm just going to enjoy it a lot more and hopefully by then I will learn I will have learned Spanish a bit more as well um, so that if I am alone at least I won't feel abandoned so um, you know I should be all right. So I'm really excited to do that. So let me know all your thoughts about this video in the comment section below. And if you did like this video, please give it a like. Please subscribe if you want to see more videos of me reacting to all things Mexico. And until next time, guys, stay safe and I'll see you soon.